We see a lot of changes in 1864 regarding the Civil War, so let's get started to find out what those changes were. The Confederates are growing weaker as a whole. The Union has had the major successes at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, so they are stronger and winning more. Grant has become a hero in the North, claiming many victories in the Southwest. President Lincoln takes notice of his leadership and gives him the highest command in the Army as general to lead the Union troops until the end of the war. This happens in March. Lincoln has gone through a strong or a string of field of failed military leaders. Just think about it. Lincoln has fired McDowell, McClellan, Pope, Burnside, Hooker, and Meade. And now he's finally choosing Grant. And he end up, ends up sticking with this decision for his military leadership until the war ends. Another general important to 1864 is William Tecumseh Sherman. He's from Ohio, and he becomes Grant's second in command at this time. Obviously, not everyone agrees with the decisions the president makes. We can even see this today with our current president. When Lincoln appointed Grant, he got a lot of criticism. One reason for this was that Grant had a reputation of being an alcoholic. Whether or not he actually was, Lincoln was looking for a leader who would lead his army to victories and end the war as soon as possible. The Battle of Cold Harbor took place at the beginning of June in 1864 in Virginia. You have probably started to notice that a lot of Civil War battles have been taking place in this state. The Confederates were led by General Robert E. Lee, which had about 62,000 troops, and the Union Army was led by both General Grant and General Meade. And you can see a real photograph of them planning out their battle strategy before Cold Harbor here. The Union Army outnumbered the Confederates by a lot at 108,000 men. Yet, despite the numbers, the Confederates strategically outmovered, outmaneuvered the massive Union armies and claimed the victory in this battle. Now, the Battle of Cold Harbor was one of the Civil War's most dramatic and decisive engagements. The Union attacked first, but the Confederates held the line. Within the first 30 minutes of the battle, Grant lost 7,000 men. That is a lot and fast. Now you will notice that the photograph here shows the trenches that the soldiers dug to help them defend themselves in this battle. Both sides dug trenches, which became a new military tactic um, that the soldiers used after Gettysburg. You can see these earthworks even though they are less noticeable when you go visit the battlefield at Cold Harbor today. Many of the Union soldiers who had been a part of the first attack had actually predicted that they would not have success, which seems weird. In fact, one guy from Massachusetts wrote in his journal that June 3rd, 1864 at Cold Harbor, Virginia was the day he was killed. Kind of creepy, if you ask me. Check out this map of Virginia. It shows the many Civil War battles that took place in the state over the four years of fighting. Think for a minute why Virginia was such a target location for battles. Why was attacking and defending around these areas so crucial to the Union or the Confederates? If you know a little bit about the locations of the Union and Confederate capital cities, you may better understand why battlefields around or abound in Virginia. Washington, D.C. is right on the northeastern border of the state, and the Union would have wanted to keep the Confederates away from their capital. In the same way, Richmond, Virginia is smack dab in the middle of the state, and the rebels would have wanted to protect and defend their capital city from being captured by the Union enemy. The Siege of Petersburg is probably the biggest battle during 1864. Notice the dates. It starts in mid-June and lasts for nine months. Remember, we stop calling them battles and start calling them sieges when they last for that long. Petersburg was in Virginia, a little further out west of Richmond, and it was a big factory city for the Confederates and had been supplying the army with weapons and cannons and ammunition over the course of the war. So it was an important city for the rebels to protect. General Lee and Beauregard dug trenches around the city and placed their army in long lines around the circumference to fortify Petersburg from an 
any Union attack. And you can see that here. If the Union captured Petersburg and gained control of this city, the Confederates would not be able to keep fighting because this was one of the last major cities supplying the army now. Most of the others had already been captured by the Yankees. On a whole, the Confederate Army was doing poorly. The men had not been issued replacement uniforms, shoes, or other supplies necessary for fighting. General Grant and General Meade both knew this, and that is why they chose to build trenches and set up military camps around this city. For months, the Union barraged the city with mortars and cannonballs. The trenches became the living quarters for many of the soldiers, for both the Union troops and the Confederate troops. They did not know whether either side would attack, and the suspense made things even more stressful. They lived in muddy and unsanitary conditions for months, including the cold, harsh winter, with little to eat and shelter themselves from the elements. The Siege of Petersburg was really rough for the men there. Personally, I have a great-great-great-grandfather who died at the Siege of Petersburg. Trench warfare was a new military tactic that we see used here, but also carried through in future warfare like in World War I. At different times throughout the nine months, parts of the armies would engage in fighting, and one of those battles during the Siege of Petersburg was called the Battle of the Crater. It was unique because the Union troops dug a tunnel from their trench underground across to and below one of the Confederate fortress trench stations. Their plan was to keep their efforts a secret and then to fill the tunnel with explosives and dynamite in an attempt to blow up the Confederate camp above the tunnel. On July 30th, 1864, the tunnel was ready and they set it off. Sure enough, the explosives blew a huge hole in the ground and some Southern soldiers died from the dynamite. It left a huge crater that is still at the battlefield at Petersburg today. The Union troops saw the damage it had done, so they ran towards the crater to pick off the Confederate soldiers on, the, on their side. However, they ran right into the crater, not realizing that Confederates surrounded the upper rim of the crater and began shooting down at them. Unfortun unfortunately, there was a lot of death and fighting in the crater, and you can see from the pictures that the Union soldiers were trapped in the hole that they had created. Their inventive idea had brought many Union troops to their own deaths, and this little battle of the crater ended up being a small victory for the Confederates. However, overall, the outcome of the Siege of Petersburg was that the Confederates could not outlast the masses of Grant's Union troops that had surrounded them around the city. Grant decides one way that he can defeat Lee and the Confederates is by cutting off their supply line by destroying railroads. Even though the Confederates had built defenses and had held the Yankees off for nine months, Grant had run, or Lee had run out of supplies, ammunition, and food to keep his Confederate army going any longer. Lee had a tough decision to make, and he finally chose to take his army further west, hoping to meet up with another part of the Confederate army that may have reinforcements, food, and necessary supplies to provide for his men, who were now dying from starvation. Grant and the northern troops move into Petersburg after the rebels leave and they take over the city. So while the Siege of Petersburg is going on in Virginia, the Battle of Atlanta down in Georgia is taking place further south between a different branch of the Confederate Army under the leadership of a Southern general named Hood and under the leadership of the uh, Union General Sherman, who I had introduced to you earlier. This battle lasted two months and could be considered a siege as well. The Confederates had been defending the city of, uh, of Atlanta, but as you can see from the battle map, that very few Confederate uh, attacks were successful and broke through the northern lines. Over time, Confederates could not outlast the Union bombardment, and because so many of the railroads and transportation had been destroyed by the Union Army, few supplies, reinforcements, and ammunition could get could get to the Confederates defending the town of Atlanta from other parts of the South. So Atlanta finally fell to the Union Army and General Sherman on September 2nd, 1864. 
So back in the North, Lincoln's four years of being president were up. So he needed to run for re-election again and have the people of the United States vote for him to remain the president. Guess who ran against him? General George B. McClellan. One of the first Union Army generals that Lincoln fired back in 1861. A lot of people in the North were actually really tired of being at war with the rebellious southern states, and people were questioning whether Lincoln should stay the president and keep America in a civil war with itself. However, the Battle of Atlanta really changes the people's minds about the election, and when Sherman victoriously beats the Confederates down in Georgia, the North gets really excited and starts believing that the war will end soon with a huge win for the United States. And guess what? It pays off for Lincoln. The people in the North re-elect him again, and the president is Abraham Lincoln for the next four more years. Sherman does not stop with Atlanta. He believes that the South will never give up unless they are destroyed from the inside. So he orders his men to march from Atlanta, Georgia in the northwestern part of the state to Savannah, Georgia in the southeast along the Atlantic coastline. This is famously called Sherman's March to the Sea. As the Union Army marched, the soldiers set fire, destroy, and ruin the farms, homes, and crops that are in their path. The idea was to weaken the Confederates at home so that they had nothing to send to their army and had nothing left to make money and keep their country strong. Sherman's army marched 300 miles from November 15th to December 21st, east to Savannah, and destroyed everything in their way in a 60-mile wide path. Sherman wanted to make the Confederates left in the South have no hope that they could still win the war. He knew some of them were hardcore and would want to keep fighting anyway. Many Georgians were frightened by the Union soldiers who were doing this, and many, even to this day, resent Sherman and the Army for what they did to the South. Four days before Christmas, Sherman and his men make it to Savannah. Their march to the sea is over. Sherman captures the city and mails a telegram to the newly re-elected President Lincoln, saying that Lincoln's Christmas present from Sherman is the city of Savannah, now occupied and under the control of the Union Army. 